Kale talked to you about coin selection in the wallet. I'm going to talk about a different concept, which is kind of a higher level than coin selection. So coin selection is where you're, you're taking these UTXOs and you're deciding which ones to put into your transaction. And those are all UTXOs in your wallet. Um, I'm going to talk about what are commonly called HD wallets. That doesn't mean they're high def. It means they're hierarchical deterministic. Um, and they solve certain problems in, in, in how wallets are designed. So I'm going to talk about the problems of address reuse. Kali talked about that very briefly. Um, then I'll talk about BIP32, which is the, the, the BIP that defines how we create HD wallets. And if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll talk about BIPs 39, 43, and 44, which are um, BIPs from Slush, the, the maker of the Trezor hardware wallet. Okay, so you've probably heard of address reuse. Kali said it was bad. Um, why is that? Why don't we like re address reuse? Well, there's a few reasons. First, it's really bad for privacy. Um, like Kali said, there are these things called there's this thing called chain analysis where people can look at transactions on the Bitcoin network and by looking at the connections in that graph they can determine certain things about the owner of those transactions. Um, address reuse is also possibly bad for ECDSA security and it's also bad for quantum security. So I'll, I'll talk about those briefly. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a, a connected graph. You have UTXOs which are unspent transaction outputs they go into new transactions and new outputs come from those transactions. So it's a big connected graph. And if you look at that graph, you can determine certain things about who's using the network. Bitcoin transactions are pseudonymous. There's no names attached to them. But if you look at patterns, if you do what's called chain analysis, you can maybe determine things about who's using Bitcoin and who owns the Bitcoin that you're looking at. Um, that's really bad for privacy. It's really bad for fungibility. And reusing, reusing addresses can reveal additional information, right? If, if someone knows your address and you reuse it, they then know about that transaction and they know that it's connected to you. So that's a, that's a really compelling reason not to reuse addresses. Another reason is for ECDSA security. So when you sign a transaction, you're using ECDSA elliptic curve cryptography, uh, which Jimmy talked about yesterday. And part of that is a signature requires an ephemeral key, which is a, a cryptographically secure number, a, a random number. And if you have a broken random number and you, sorry, a, a broken random number generator and you reuse that same random number to sign with, its, with the same private key, then you reveal your private key, right? So, so part of ECDSA is having a strong um, cryptographically secure random num number generator. If your number generator is insecure and you're reusing the same address, reusing the same private key, then you're revealing your private key to the world. So not reusing addresses prevents um, that problem from happening if your random number generator is broken. And finally, quantum security. This is kind of like a bit further out. But sending to an address using P2SH on Bitcoin does not reveal the public key of that address. If you remember from what Jimmy told you yesterday morning, P2SH sends to a hash of the public key. So you don't know what the public key is even when, when you're sending to that address. But spending from that address reveals the redemption script. It reveals the public key. Does that make sense? ECDSA is not quantum secure. So if quantum computers come out in a few years' time with a sufficient number of qubits, then someone will be able to take a public key and from that public key work out what the private key is. But hashing, SHA-256, is a bit more quantum secure. Right? Hashing, you'd need a really powerful quantum computer to break SHA-256. In fact, traditional computers are probably faster than quantum computers in that respect. So if you just send to an address once and you don't reveal the public key, um, in the future, people won't be able to take that public key and use a quantum computer to work out what the private key is. This is kind of a, a longer term thing, longer term consideration. Any questions about that? Why, why is not you RFC 6979 used for determinism? Deterministic ephemeral key. 
yeah, that's that's one way to ensure that you're not going to reuse a random number. Uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, just to be clear for this one, this is only a problem if your random number generator is broken. We, we don't believe that. That's not the case in Bitcoin Core, we don't believe. Um, but if you're using a wallet and it turns out at a later date that your random number generator was broken and you reused addresses, then you've, you've maybe revealed your private key. Yes. Uh, I think the PlayStation 3 had a an ephemeral key which was static, and was it PlayStation 3 or 2? PlayStation 3. 3, okay. And they they read the RFC for ECDSA and they said, and they read that you need a random number to input, and they picked a random number, and that's what they used for their implementation, and that was broken. So, yes. Correct, yes. If, if we have sufficiently powerful quantum computers in the future and you sent to a public key and you've revealed that public key, someone will be able to take that public key and derive the private key. Yeah, a qubit is like one quantum bit. Um, I'm, I'm having to rush a bit, so maybe I can take questions at the end if we have time, because I'm already a little bit behind schedule. So. Can we just rush on through? Uh, I'm going to talk about BIP32, which is where HD wallets were defined. It's a, a Bitcoin improvement pro proposal um, put forward by Peter Wooler back in, I believe, 2012 or 13, maybe. Um, so what use cases do HD wallets fulfill apart from avoiding address reuse? Well, it means that you can share a full wallet. Um, prior to having a, an HD wallet and be, being able to reconstruct a tree of keys. If you wanted to avoid address reuse, you'd have to generate a bunch of random keys, which is fine, it's like you have a big box of keys, but that's really difficult to share between different computers, different wallets. Much better if you have one seed and you can derive all of your private keys from that. Um, and another use case is you might have a single seed private key for your entire company, and then derive branches, sub-branches from that seed key, one for each of your offices or departments. So all of those can be derived by your, your headquarters or central account, um, but each department has their own balance. Another use case is recurrent transactions. You can give someone a public key and say, and what's called the chain code, and say, send me Bitcoin to this address and derive future addresses to send to me. So you're sending, you, your payee is sending different addresses for each transaction, but they all belong to you. And then finally, you can create an insecure money receiver. So you could have a web front end which is deriving new addresses, but doesn't know anything about the private keys. So if your web server gets hacked, your Bitcoin aren't at risk. Okay, so like I said earlier, the best practice is only to use addresses once. Once you've sent from address, you shouldn't receive to that address again. That would be insecure and not good for your privacy. But having many unlinked private keys is difficult to back up and share. So better to have a seed and a way to deterministically, that's a D in HD, derive new private keys from that seed. You could create a hash chain, right? You could create something like that, where you have a a seed and then you hash it to get a private key and then you hash it again to get a second private key and then you hash it again. Um, that would be a perfectly acceptable scheme. Those would all be private. But sharing that, sorry, let me go back. Sharing that hash chain is all or nothing. Once you've shared one part of that chain, say you share private key two, anyone can derive all of the future private keys in that chain. Much better is a tree which allows sub-branches to be shared individually. So instead of having a chain like this, you have a tree, right? And you have a hierarchy, so that's the H in HD. Any questions about that? Make sense? Okay, pretty easy. So, BIP32 talks about how to generate this tree, and a, a very high level overview 
is you generate a seed from random bits. That can be anything, but I think it's up to 256, actually, not 512. So 128 to 256 bits of randomness. You use what's called an HMAC. That's a hash message authentication code. It's a, a keyed hash function to derive the children of each node. And to generate the master key, M, you take an HMAC. An HMAC takes an input of a, a value, data, plus a key. The key is Bitcoin seed, and the data is your S, the seed. And you do an HMAC using SHA-512 of that to get I. The left 256 bits of that output is your private key, the master private key. And the right 256 bits is called the chain code, the master chain code. Uh, nothing to do with the company I work for. So how do you derive children from each node? You use this function or this function. So there's two versions. There's what's called the non-hardened. That's the top one. Um, for i is less than 2 to the 31, you do the same HMAC. Your key is the chain code of the parent, and the data is the public key of the parent. Right, that, that uppercase K. Let me see if I can. No, I, OK, I, I can't point to it. That, that uppercase K indicates that it's a public key, it's a point on the elliptic curve, and then you concatenate that with I, and you take the HMAC of that. That, that gives you big I. For the hardened version, um, it's a similar formula. The key is the chain code of the parent, and the data is zero, the, the byte zero, concatenated with the private key. That lowercase K is a, an, an integer, it's a private key, and concatenate that with the index I. Okay, so why are there two different versions? Well, the idea is that you can give a non-hardened public key out and people can derive children from that non-hardened public key. So that use case is, for example, the recurrent transactions or the insecure Bitcoin receiving address. And a hardened key, you can't do that. You can't take a, a public key parent and derive the child. Okay, so the left leftmost bits is the child private key um, added to, to K, and the right bits are the child chain code. And this function is called child key de derivation private. So the public version of that is only possible for non-hardened child keys, as I explained, and the function here is taking, it's the same as for the, the private key derivation, except you can only use I for less than two to the 31. So that's a non-hardened version. And that's called child key derivation public. OK. Um, BIP32 also defines what's called an extended key format. It's 78 bytes. And the, the format is as follows, four bytes of version. And that's just describing what kind of extended key this is. It could be a, an extended public key or an extended private key. And it's just four magic bytes. So for Bitcoin mainnet, that's 0488B21E. Uh, one byte gives you the depth in that tree. Four bytes is what's called the fingerprint of the parent. I'll talk about what that is in a bit. Uh, four bytes is the index, that I that I was talking about. Anything between 0 and 2 to the 32 minus 1. And 32 bytes of the chain code. And 33 bytes either of the public key in compressed format or 00. zero concatenated with the private key, which is 32 bytes. Okay, so what's that fingerprint? Well, the identifier of the extended key is the hash 160 of the public key, so that is the RIPEMD160 hash of the SHA-256 hash of the public key, and that's the same data used in the address. So if you remember from Jimmy's class yesterday, that's how you derive an address from a public key. Um, the fingerprint is just the 30, first 32 bits of that identifier. Okay, so it's the same data, but um, for the address, you put that into the um, the encoding, the base 58 encoding. So how do you use that to construct a, a key? Well, you repeatedly apply the child key derivation function, and the notation for that is the index of each child separated by slashes. So for example, M, that's the master key, M slash 3H slash 2 slash 5, that 
denotes the third hardened child of, sorry, the fifth child, the fifth non-hardened child of the second non-hardened child of the third hardened child of the master. And sometimes you'll see a dash instead of an H. Any questions about that? You, you, you've probably seen this format. Um, if you've used like a Trezor wallet or any other kind of HD wallet, they'll, they'll show you that index of the, the key in the tree. BIP32 also defines, so BIP32 gives this kind of framework and it doesn't um, dictate how you use it, but it does give you a default wallet layout. And this is what the layout is. The wallet's organized into a few accounts, indexed by I, and each account has two chains. The internal, that's used for giving out addresses where you want to receive new funds, and the, um, I think I got this the wrong way around. Yes, the external is for giving out addresses. The internal is used for change addresses. Um, and I here is the index of the account. One and zero indicates whether it's internal or external, and K is the, the index of the address. So if you look at BIP32, you'll see this diagram. Um, at the top, on the left, you have the master seed, and then you have a number of accounts, M0, M1, down to MI. And then for each account, you have an external chain, which is used for giving out addresses for payment, and an internal chain, which is used for change, um, change outputs and so on. Okay, so a few things to note about security of HD wallets. If you have a child extended private key and I, the attacker can't walk up the tree. They can't find the parent private tree, so that's good. Um, and if you have any number of extended private keys and the index I, um, the attacker can't determine whether they come from a common parent. So that's good. That's good for if you lose a private key, then your whole organization's Bitcoin are not at risk. However, here's a big note. If you have a parent extended public key and a non-hardened child private key, it is possible to derive the parent extended private key. So if you walk down non-hardened routes down this tree, um, non-hardened paths, you can walk back up, potentially. So that's an important thing to note if you're implementing a wallet with HD. Okay, um, I'm slightly overrunning, Ant is Anton in the room? Okay, I'll, I'll quickly go through these. Um, bit 39, bit 43, bit 44. Um, they're, they're interesting, they're not standard, really. They're used by Trezor, um, pr probably by some other wallet um, implementers, but there are reasons that people might not want to use these BIPs. So BIP39 is about mnemonics. It's a way to generate that seed, that 32-byte, sorry, 128, 256-bit um, seed using a mnemonic. And it was submitted by Slush at Satoshi Labs. So Slush runs a mining pool, and they also produce this hardware wallet, Trezor, um, and it's used in Trezor. Like I said, there are some criticisms of the method. So there are two parts to BIP32, sorry, BIP39. Um, First is generating that mnemonic sentence, and you create, you start by creating some, some bits of entropy. You call those bits ent. You append some, the length of that ent divided by 32 bits. Uh, sorry, you hash the entropy, and you take the length divided by 32, and you append that. And then you split that, those concatenated bits into 11-bit chunks. So, and each of those chunks corresponds to a word in a 2048 word list. For example, here are 12 words from that list. So if you take 120, 28 bits of entropy, um, divide that by 32, that length is four, right? So the length of the entropy plus, plus that checksum is 132, and divide that by 11, you get 12 words in your mnemonic. Um, if you have more bits of entropy, your, the words in your mnemonic sentence is longer. And then you go from that sentence to a seed. Um, uh, yeah, so you use something called password-based key derivation function two. That's 2048 rounds of th that same HMAC that I talked about earlier, only SHA-256 instead of, instead of SHA-512. 
the password is the mnemonic sentence, and it takes also an argument called salt, which is the word mnemonic, or the string mnemonic, plus an op optional passphrase. So there's some criticism of BIP39. One of the criticisms is that a fixed word list is required because of the way the checksum is computed. Um, it also doesn't have versioning, so it doesn't tell you anything about how the tree, the HD tree is derived from that seed. So you might have the seed, but you might not know where to look for um, your addresses. And it also relies on the security of that uh, CS, your random number generator. It's not clear after putting your randomness through this PBKDF to whether it was any better using randomness and using just a passphrase. Any questions on that? Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of rushing because we're a little bit pushed for time. Okay, um, so finally BIPs 43 and 44. Um, again, these are defined by Slush at Satoshi Labs, and they impose some kind of structure on the key tree. So if you remember, BIP32 doesn't dictate what the, the structure of that tree should be. It just tells you how you can create a tree. Um, BIP43 and 44 try and put some kind of standardness on how you create that tree. And it's intended for portability between wallets, wallet implementations. So if you know how the tree is derived, you could take your seed from one wallet and potentially import it into a different wallet. BIP43 is really short, it just says that the first level of the tree should be an index which indicates the purpose. So for example, BIP44, the purpose is 44, and the first level of that tree is the hardened 44th child of the master key. BIP44 defines the entire structure for the tree, and it gives this, this structure, um, the master key, then the first level is the purpose, the second level is the coin type, then account, then whether it's internal or external, and the address index. So purpose is 44, because this is bit 44. The coin type is which coin you're using this for, so the idea is you could use the same HD structure for coins for different, wallets for different coins, right? You could have the same HD which stores your um, Bitcoin and your Litecoin and your Dogecoin and whatever other kind of coin you want. Um, the index there is defined in Satoshi Labs slip Satoshi Labs Improvement Proposal 44, and Bitcoin mainnet is zero. The account and the change and the address index are exactly as defined in BIP32, that default wallet format. And finally, um, BIP44 explains how to discover an account when you're importing it into a new wallet, so restoring a backup or moving between wallet implementations. Um, that account field starts from zero, and you scan the external chain. So you look for payments into that account until there's a gap of 20 unused addresses. And if that account does have transactions, you look for the next account. And you keep doing that until you find an account with no transactions, and then you're done. OK. I apologize. I ran through that really, really quickly. Um, I can probably take a few questions if there were any questions from that. Yep. Uh, on the criticism side of the previous tip, uh, the, you're saying the PBKDF is no, like, maybe no better than a white hat or TV. Yeah, so in bit 43, sorry, 39, you start off with some entropy to create the mnemonic, and then you feed that mnemonic into this PBKDF, which is multiple rounds of um, that HMAC with SHA-256. So there's been some criticism, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I've read criticism that supplying randomness into that PBKDF may be no better than supplying a password into that PBKDF. And so the... So the user password that last call. Yeah, so the passphrase is, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Right, so there's an optional passphrase. Um, the password in this PBKDF is a mnemonic sentence, and then you can supply an additional passphrase, which you can do on Trezor if you've ever used that. You have your 12, 12 words or 24 words, and then you have an optional passphrase, and that's, that's where that's used. The criticism is, Uh, 
Um, yeah, if the randomness, if your randomness is broken going into that PBKDF, then the whole scheme is broken. Yeah. Yep. Right, the question is, if you have a seed and you try to recover your wallet from that seed, is there a defined way of recovering the, the wallet and finding all of the addresses that are used in the tree? The answer is no, because there's no real standard. Um, so Bitcoin Core has its own tree that it uses, so you could restore a seed from Bitcoin Core into Bitcoin Core. Uh, Bit44 was an attempt to make that standard, but um, different wallet implementations might or might not use Bit44. The question is, um, the quantum insecurity of sec P256, is that specific to the curve sec P256, or is that a general property of elliptic curve cryptography? Um, it's a general property of elliptic curve cryptography. The, re the property we use in elliptic curves to create the signing algorithm is what's called the discrete log problem. It means it's really difficult to find um, how many times the generator goes into your, your private key uh, with a quantum computer that, that would be a lot easier if you had enough qubits. Probably want to say you're more than that. It's not just a list of curve, it's whatever next cryptography you might what are at least the kind of asking next cryptography that I've been so far. Right, any any yeah, any kind of discrete log based cryptography. There are um, asymmetric cryptography protocols which are apparently more quantum secure, but I'm by no means an expert on that. The question is, is the uh, BIP32, is BIP32 specific to sec P256? No, it could be used on other curves. Oh, uh, the question is, what do I mean by different coins being stored in the same HD wallet? Um, yeah, this one here. So when I say coin type, I mean literally different currencies, different cryptocurrencies. Um, a private key is just, in Bitcoin, is just a 256-bit number. And if you have a different cryptocurrency where the private key is a 256-bit number, you can you can use BIP32 to derive new 32-bit numbers. Yeah, you can have one seed and, and multiple chains. That's the idea behind BIP44. Okay, any other questions? All right, well that's the last. You're gonna have to listen to me talk, so thank you again for your patience. Um, I don't know who's up next.